And today's class is pretty much describing a quick overview of the topics we're most familiar with. How many of you have, are used to and have used the word or understand the term correlation? Correlation? Covariance. No, don't know what covariance is. D squares? No one knows what D squares is. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, this e squared section is going to um, build up on the previous section we've considered, the univariate section. But I feel confidence interval, we're going to bring that in. We're going to use data visualization quite strongly as well as a, as a preliminary inspection of our data set. And the, the reason why this, this section is here is obviously because it builds on those two, but also we're going to use it very heavily in the next section. The whole of the next section on design experiments you're going to analyze your experimental model using a least squares model. So your least squares model is going to be the basis for your theory. And more importantly than just the fact that you're learning to do in the DOE section, is the fact that your least squares model is coming up in everything that you do as an engineer. Even in the lab reports, when you start to work, guaranteed you'll see a least squares model pretty much every single year as an engineer that you work in your career. There's certain important caveats we have to understand. How do you interpret that R squared in a meaningful way? How do you interpret what these figures mean? How do you check for confidence intervals with those confidence Those are very, very important tools. And unfortunately, you're learning this probably a little bit too late. It would be beneficial to know this earlier on through the lab reports and so on. But let's take a look at what you've learned, recognize where the problems are, and learn how to correctly interpret these new squares models going forward. So here's some ways that you can use it. If your manager asks you, well, how does the yield from the dash reactor go to the purity of the raw material that you use? So you're putting in some sucrose and you're getting a yield of certain um, product of interest. How does that yield depend on the purity of the raw material? So many times we can, in our process, predict what the end point is going to be before we run the process. Tremendously powerful. We can make a prediction at the end, at the beginning. So here we can say, we can reply to your manager, well, look, we can predict it with a certain error range. That's also important. I wanted to know what our prediction is, but what is our level of confidence in the prediction for that? And the converse is sometimes also equally important, recognizing when you're not able to make a reasonable prediction. Okay, so how about the relationship between yield and another raw materials purity? Well, you can say, well, over this data set that I have available, I cannot make any prediction. So where I've used this most recently myself was um, I'm writing up a paper that shows the effect of time on testing exams. So many of you who took 4M and 4M, we had the infinite time midterm. The data from that is showing quite clearly that there's no relationship between the amount of time you have available and your final grade. It's an interesting result because it says that time-based tests versus non-time-based tests give equivalent results. So having time-based tests is a valid way of assessing students. So these are really important ways of learning a model. How do we make that judgment at the end? How can I say that with confidence that one variable has no effect on it? Okay, so this section we're starting to bring two variables in. Up to now, we've only considered one variable at a time. We've looked at the monitoring charts for one variable. We've looked at these at um, just visualizing one data at a time. We've built confidence intervals of one data vector at a time. Now we're going to go to two vectors, <coughs> relating one vector to another vector. So we're going to bring some new notation for that. Sometimes we don't want to overstate things. Quantify, but you sometimes this is a, a weaker form of using the model, but simply just to judge what that relationship is. Is the relationship linear or is it non linear? And if it's non linear, recognizing when it's non linear so that we can maybe apply some form of transformation or bring it into a linear model. So we will address that topic after the next after the term. So here's where we're going. We've seen this model many times. Y is beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus an error in front of this that we do know y is equal to mx plus c plus some error. Any one of those notations, y is equal to x plus beta 0, 
my intercept and my slope, respectively, plus some residual error here. What we want to build in this section is, is determine confidence intervals for that slope and intercept. I would like to be able to write beta 1, that slope, is between some upper bound and some lower bound. So beta 1 is my population slope. I do not know the true slope. But I want to find a lower bound and upper bound for it to be able to say that slope is significant or not significant from a statistical point of view. So we're very comfortable with interpreting confidence intervals up to this point in the class. Now we're going to take that to regression or least squares models and be able to build confidence intervals for regression parameters. So beta 1 is a, is a regression parameter, a population parameter that I don't know. I'm going to do the same for beta 0. Sometimes beta zero is also important. What is my intercept? Is that statistically significant or not? We're going to look at how to interpret those confidence intervals. We're going to learn what R squared really means, what you shouldn't interpret R squared as. And we're also going to look at how you should judge the prediction ability of the model. So sometimes we build the model so that we can calculate B1 and B0. But sometimes we're also building the model so that we can use it in the future and say, why hat? The prediction for my model is equal to B1x mu plus B0. So I would like to use my model in the future on unseen data that I've never used before. So x mu is totally fresh data, never been used when I built the model. How does that model perform? And not only that, I would like to also get y hat plus or minus be able to give my manager or myself a prediction interval that gives me a range that says this is a typical error I would expect on that prediction. So our prediction is a single number. We know that it's going to be in error. There's some error associated with that. How by how much? And so it's very important for forecasting. Quick overview picture then of where we're going. Today we're going to cover covariance correlation. We'll introduce the least squares model. So very quickly we'll cover topics one, two, and three up there. Then we're going to look at why we minimize the errors. We're going to come to this awful word that you may have seen before, ANOVA. What does it mean and how do we interpret it? That's actually the key to understanding what R squared is. And we'll, we'll take a look at that in a, in a very careful way in Friday's class. Probably after the midterm break, we'll only get to the constructing confidence intervals and prediction intervals. And then we'll come back and do a quick study of what the least squares assumptions mean. There's some very key assumptions in the least squares model. What do they mean? And particularly, what happens if those assumptions break down? Then after the midterm break, we get to some of the really interesting topics you can likely not see. Those topics are using nonlinear terms. Maybe we can cover that before. But really interesting is what we mean to do when there's integer variables. What if x mu here is the gender of a person, male, female? Or what if x is the level of education, high school, university, PhD? So those are integer variables. Or it might be country of origin, India, China, Bangladesh. So how can we work with x mu as a categorical variable or an integer variable. That's, that's phenomenally important when it gets to design experiments. Because when we change our experiments, our experiments are often changing binary variables, like catalyst A versus catalyst B. So we have to be able to work with integer or categorical variables. We'll look at residuals and discuss the concept of leverage, discrepancy, and influence. And that's pretty much uh, where we will go to in terms of covering additional topics. There's a whole rich wealth of material we could go into, but we're going to just cover these topics so that we can use these squares for the DOE section that follows afterwards. And particularly, we're going to rely on software to do the work for us. So very important is to learn how to interpret the outperformance. Now, the notes that you have from the course website are probably okay for, for, for most of you, but if you would like to extend your insight and knowledge, I highly recommend the first two books, particularly the first one. John Fox is a professor here at Mac in sociology. He's written a really good book on least squares, and he's also the author of the car library that you've used in R up to now. So take a look at that. Uh, he also offers a good graduate course if any of you do bad studies later.
The second book is okay, very theoretical. Fox Hunt and Hunter is very practical. You can go take a look at, at that. He only covers it very lightly. Montgomery and Runner is, if you, if you have a book written, you will to go back to that. So let's, let's take a look at covariance and correlation. Covariance. So I asked you earlier what does covariance mean, and almost none of you stuck your hands. So let's take a look at it as an, at, at it as an example. If I take a gas cylinder and I immerse it in a water bath or some controlled environment, or let's say a room rather. So here's my gas cylinder, and I measure the temperature and I measure the pressure in that closed cylinder. So this is a controlled environment. I can record the values. And let's say I know the volume of the cylinder is 20 meters. There's a one kilogram of gas in that cylinder and the gas constant. So from the ideal gas law, I know PD equals MRT. I can rewrite it as P is equal to beta 1 times T. What's my relationship between pressure in the cylinder versus the temperature in the cylinder? And I'll have this variable beta 1 that links the temperature to the pressure. We know that we can guess an estimate of beta 1 as the number of moles times the gas constant divided by the volume would be a good initial guess for beta 1. And in fact, it would be an accurate guess if the system did follow the ideal gas law correctly. But my measurements of temperature and of pressure are going to have error. So I'm never going to know the exact population beta 1. What is that E1 value that we're going to estimate for beta 1? Now, in this example, I'm just going to consider for the moment what is the covariance and correlation between pressure and temperature. Let's take a look at what that means. So we know that pressure and temperature, how are they going to behave with each other? Temperature goes up. What will happen to the pressure in the cylinder? It goes up as well. So we expect a relationship there between temperature and pressure. Let's look at this numerically, quantify the relationship. We're going to use the covariance first as one way to do that, and then we're going to look at the correlation as another way to do that. So there's my raw data. Temperature measured, going from lower to higher temperatures, and pressure in the cylinder goes up as well as temperature increases as we expect. Mean and variance of the respective data points are recorded there. And also, by the way, I've recorded humidity. So I've got a third variable going here where I'm recording the humidity. In the, in the room. So temperature and pressure are in the cylinder, and humidity is in the room. So here's the formal definition for covariance. We say that covariance is x minus x bar, x minus the mean, y minus the mean. Let's take the product of that and take the expected value. Let's decode what all, the, all those steps mean. The first step is to compute deviation variables. That's what this interior uh, term is in brackets. So x minus x bar. Let's use temperature for x and pressure for y. Temperature t minus t bar and p minus p bar. What all that does is it does what we call it mean centering. So we've done that several times up to now. Of course, we've created z values. We've centered our z around zero by subtracting the mean. So each one of these operations here, t minus t bar, p minus p bar is doing exactly that, subtracting so to the center. Then we take the product of them. So I've got my centered vector for t, I've got my centered vector for p. So these are a vector of values that range above and below zero, a vector of values that range above and below zero for p as well. Take the product of those two vectors, element by element. So if I went back to my polymer data here, I'd subtract the temperature from the average, I'd subtract the pressure from the average, and then take the product of those two. So this is, the key point here is that this is element by element, multiplication of the center vectors. So I'm going to get a new vector now that contains the product of these two center data. And if I take that vector, that new, newly calculated vector, and then compute the mean of that vector, that's exactly what this expectation operator is telling me, is to take the expected value of what's ever inside those curly braces. Well, the expectation operator is just calculating the mean. So calculate the mean of my 
a product of centered vectors, I'll get a value of 6780. And I encourage you to go home and prove that you can get that value. And that's, that's exactly what my covariance is. I follow that rule. Take the expected value of the product of the two centered vectors. That's the definition of covariance. And you get this number 6780. It also has units. The units are the product of the individual units. So it's Kelvin times pressure. So what? What does that number mean? Okay, so it's big, it's positive, it's got these strange units. Let's take a look at another example, the covariance between temperature in the cylinder and humidity in the room. Repeat that procedure, you'll get a value of 202 Kelvin times percent. Again, positive number, smaller than it was before for this other example, awkward units again. We're still not anywhere further figuring out what this covariance thing means. Well, let's step back a bit and take a look at another twist on covariance and try to understand what's going on. If I took the covariance of a variable with itself, so instead of x versus with y, let me calculate the covariance of a variable with itself. So x with x. So I replace that. We get this, take the centered value of x minus x bar, x minus x bar, squared in, and calculate the expected value. The expected value is the mean. What is the mean doing? It takes the sum of the individual elements and divides it by n. So if I rewrote that term up there as follows, and quickly see what's starting to happen here, is I could write this as x minus x bar, and say take the expected value of that. I could rewrite this as x minus x bar squared, sum them up, and divide by n. That's exactly what they say. And you'll recognize it quite immediately as the definition of variance. Okay, so variance, uh, we may have in the past had n minus 1, or n doesn't really matter for our purposes here. The fact is that covariance of x with x is nothing more than the variance of x. Okay, so if you understand variance as a measure of how, by how much a variable changes, covariance is simply telling you how much one variable changes when with another variable. So how two variables co-vary is what covariance is. So it's a very straightforward way of looking at it. Another point I wanted to point out for you is that we can often write this as x transpose x. So I'm kind of preempting material that's going to come later on in the course. But let's imagine that I've got a vector x, and that vector x is already centered at 0. x transpose x is exactly the same as taking the sum of squares of x x transpose y is the product of x with y. So I'm just putting that out there for, for you. We're going to get to that point later on. So let's go back to covariance with one variable against another, x against y. And let's work through a few examples. If I take x as the number of hours worked per week for, for, for various people, and I take y, to be the value of the take-home pay that those individuals have earned. So I construct a table with x equal to hours and y equals to pay earned. And I take it for several different individuals. What would be the value of the covariance you might expect? Would it be positive or negative? someone who's just got an obscenely lucrative government position perhaps or uh, that they're working very little for a lot of take-home pay 
There's always exceptions here. So we'll get to that in a minute. But the key thing I want you to start to recognize is that I've got one variable against another. Covariance is giving you a measure of how those two variables tend to move together. So if I took another data set, age of married person one versus age of married person two, what is the general tendency we would see in a large population of people? exception to that. Expectation rather is that the, if you smoke more, you're going to die at a younger age. A more traditional Cambridge example the temperature at the top tray of the distillation column related to the purity Y of the product. For many, for many systems, that has a very strong relationship and it's not always positive or negative. There's no general guidance there, but there is a correlation in any case, but kind of covariance between those two data. Okay, so the key I want you to get from this section on covariance is that it's describing the tendency between two variables, and the sign is about the only useful piece of information you can take from that. So is covariance and correlation not synonymous? No, no, we're going to look at correlation next, yeah. So, yeah. so here, just, a, just the key summary is that covariance gets you a number with units, and the only thing you can take from covariance is the sign. The number numerically means nothing. Okay, if I go re-express my pressure values, here I express my pressure values in KPA. If I go rewrite those pressure values in terms of pascals, I'm going to get numbers that are a thousand times bigger. And then this number over here is going to be huge. Okay, so I'm not going to get 6780 anymore, I'm just going to get a different number in order of millions. So again, it's pretty useless because I can totally, I can give, give you a different covariance just by changing my units. We don't like that sort of thing. So we look at removing the effect of units, and that's what correlation does for us. So correlation takes the scaling effect out, and it does that by taking our definition for covariance, and we divide through by the individual variance products of x and y, and we take the square root. So this term over here in the denominator doesn't have a special name, but covariance in the numerator, the product of the variance is square rooted in the denominator. That ratio gets in correlation. And if we take a look at the units, the units of my numerator are the units of x multiplied by the units of y, and then I divide through by the units of x and y square rooted, I will get a dimensionless result. We're taking the square root of the variance, so there I'm going to get units of the standard deviation <coughs> multiplied by the units of y. I'm going to then get the dimensionless number. And that number will range between minus 1 and plus 1. So is, is this a measure of how strongly related they are? It's the same idea as covariance, except now we're scaling it and bringing it down to a reference number that will always be between minus 1 and plus 1. So the same idea, just dimensionless and now in a range that's, that's easier to work with. So let's take a look at a few of the gas cylinder examples. 
correlation between temperature and pressure then was 0.997. Correlation between pressure and temperature, notice just flipped around, the same value. Okay, so it's a symmetrical definition. If I interchange x and y, I will, I will get the same number. Correlation between temperature and humidity, 0.38. Pretty high, you might think. Right? So 0.38 in the order of 0.4. That's a, people sometimes say that's got a 40% correlation. Well, we expect no relationship between temperature and humidity. So is this 40% big or 40% small? What, is, it, is that abnormal? Is there maybe an outlier that has caused that problem? Well, let's take a look at some, some measures of correlation here, visually. So here I've shown you for synthetic data, the correlation between x and y when the correlation value is negative 0.9. So that's what that scatter plot of x versus y would look like. So there's a fair amount of spread for a 90% correlation. Here's data that I just took a random x and a random y and I plotted them and I got a correlation of minus 0.15. So it's just literally just a spread of data points on the page. Here's an interesting one that shows a positive correlation of 0.5. And to the eye, that looks like, again, there's really very little relationship there between the variables. So correlation numbers, uh, I still don't find them intuitive to work. I prefer not to in interpret them as saying 0.6 is a strong correlation or 0.8 is a strong correlation. It's hard to, to say that visually. Because even here for a 0.5 correlation, it looks like there isn't too much of a relationship between the two variables. But that is what a correlation of 0.5 could look like. Here's, here's an interesting example. Here's the correlation is essentially zero, but there's a very clear relationship between x and y. So there's a relationship, but there's no correlation. Okay? So, Maybe this next example from Wikipedia will help put it in perspective for you. Let's take a look at the first one that shows the varying levels of correlation between two random variables. The correlation of one, that's the correlation of the variable with itself. So if I calculate correlation of x with x, you'll always get a value of plus one. And that's a straight line. Correlation of 0.8 is a fair amount of spread and we get this elliptical shape. Correlation of 0.4 that ellipse starts to spread out and become more circular. And a correlation of zero, if these two variables are both normally distributed, I'll essentially get this shot of data, like a scatter shot of, of points, random spread out. So that's what a correlation of zero could look like. There's a correlation of negative 0.4, that ellipse just rotates to negative 0.8 and then negative 0.1. So that's the correlation of x with minus x. Now, correlations are not unique. So here's a correlation of plus one, it's a straight line, but you can also get correlations of plus one that look like this, and correlations of minus one that look like that. Okay, so it's not guaranteed to say that a correlation of a certain value will look something like one of these. You can get multiple appearances of the data for the same correlation value. So there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between correlation and the appearance of the value. Here's a final example that really drives that point home. All of these are correlations of zero, but very, very different structure in the graphic form. So indicating there's no relationship, no correlation between these variables, but it's very clear in every one of these that there is a definite relationship in this last row. So, so that, uh, that should just put it in perspective. The reason why I'm coming at, to, on that point, uh, or talking more about that point is because you would recognize the square of this value as the R squared. Okay, so we're heading to that. R squared is interpreted as the correlation between the two variables as well. So, so bear that in mind, um, because it's going to strongly affect our interpretation of these squares and models later on. Then what I'll just leave you with here is a few definitions. You've likely seen these from the previous course in statistics. If not, um, they're not hard to derive. You start from the first one and you can, first one and two, and then keep going and get the others. But the key issue here is that 
Um, the only one I'd like to talk about is that in general, the variance of one variable plus the variance of a second variable is not equal to the sum of the individual um, variances. So I can't just take x plus y and then calculate the variance of that joint new variable. I can only do that if x and y are independent of each other. And we actually use this rule when we derive the, the definition for confidence. So maybe just go, if you weren't comfortable with it back then, just go back and see where we actually use this rule. Um, it is important to understand that one. There's far more details on it as well in the printed course notes if you want to see a, a complete derivation. We'll go back to any of your undergraduates uh, stats textbooks. So where I'm going here with this next section on, on these squares is, as I've emphasized, it's going to be very important to build the design of experimental models. But also, every other tool that I've seen in, in data analysis, so PCA, PLX, and, and other advanced Asian tools and so forth, all come back down to the least squares model. They often build on the least squares model and use it internally in the calculation of these more complicated models. So being comfortable with the least squares model is really, really critical to working with other data analysis methods. For those of you that will use that in the future. But even if you don't use these other methods in the future, all of you will use a, at least the least squares model itself. So it's important to understand what that model is doing. So in this, today's class, we're going to just <coughs> recap some of the definitions and we're going to um, look at some crude ways of building that model. So there we go. Um, again, the model can be written as beta 0 plus beta 1 x. And when I use that model in the future, what I would like is the expected value of the model. What I want to emphasize with this equation form here is the following. That error term is the error in y. So when we refer to error in the least squares model, it refers to the error in the y's. So we often write y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus error. That error term is not error due to x. This error refers to error in y, the measurement error in y. x is assumed to be known perfectly. So that's assumed to be known without error. So that epsilon or error term represents error in measuring y and other random variations, not due to error in x. That's, that is a key point and we'll, we'll get to have something again in the future class. And the purpose of the linear model, let's, let's, let's uh, notice some shift in the terminology here. The purpose of the linear model, y is equal to beta 1, uh, sorry, beta 0 plus beta 1 x, we'll call this a linear model. Notice I'm not using the term least squares model. The purpose of this linear model is to find estimates of beta 0 and beta 1 so that I can get the best possible predictions. And I can use any method to find values for beta 0 and beta 1. Least squares is only one way of finding those values. So if the least squares model is one form of a linear model. So understand this hierarchy. We've got linear models. Here's one particular example. It's linear because it's linear in terms of the x. Beta 0 and beta 1 are linear terms in front of x. The least squares method is one way of calculating the parameters in the linear model. jump ahead one slide and then I'll come back to this one that emphasizes this point. So what we have then is we've got data x and we've got data y. And I would like to find best estimates of e0 and e1. So I've got a table of x values, I've got a table of y values. I have 
my linear model and I would like to find B0 and B1 that estimate beta 0 and beta 1. There are many possibilities to find those estimates of B0 and B1. The least squares model is the first option. The least squares model simply says, calculate the sum of squares of the residuals. And when you minimize that sum of squares of the residuals, you found your estimates B0 and B1. Then there's a few others here, and I'm going to talk about those next. But in order to talk about that, Let's just go back then to this illustration that I skipped over. So you're, you're, you're familiar with this, but I just want to emphasize what the residual is doing here. We're going to calculate estimates B0 and B1 so that our expected value of the errors is zero. We would like our expected values of the errors to be zero. Then for a new observation x, we can bring it in and multiply it by b0 plus b1 times xi. So I have to use b0 and b1 here because I do not know the population beta 0 and the population beta 1. Those are unknown, so I find best estimates of those population parameters, beta 0 and beta 1, and I'll call them b0 and b1 respectively. So sometimes we'll write as follows, b0 is equal to beta 0 hat. So it's the best estimate of beta 0, or b1 is equal to beta 1 hat. So I'd like to find these b1, b0s, or b1s. Then when I use the model in the future, if I've got a data point here, xi, let's, let's assume for now we know what the true value, or the measured value, I should say, of y is, is that blue point over there. So I've got a new data point for x, and I happen to know its y value already. If I didn't know its y value, I, my best estimate of y is the point on the regression line given by the intercept and the slope beta 0 and beta 1, which is the open circle over there. The residual then is the vertical distance. Now that's, that's the key point I'd like to emphasize. The residual is the vertical distance. And you, you should be comfortable with that topic already. So let's go back then to some of the other options we might use to estimate B0 and B1. The least squares objective function minimizes the sum of squares of the residuals. But there's no reason why I have to penalize the sum of squares. I could penalize the sum of the residuals <coughs> to the raised to the power of 4. Why would I not raise it to the power of 3? We'll get negatives. So residuals could be positive or negative in sign. So I could raise the residuals to any even power and take the sum of those. So the standard least squares model squares them. So we quadratically penalize our residuals. But I could penalize my residuals to the power of 4. The other option I could do is to sum the perpendicular distances to the least squares line. So that's an interesting form of the, of the regression model as well. If we had to draw a picture of it quick, if I have data. I could look at penalizing the perpendicular distance from the data point to the line. So I take the sum of these distances that are perpendicular to the line. And I want to make the sum of those distances small. Another one is to take the least absolute deviations. So in the first option here, which is the least squares option, I've taken the sum of squares. Well, I'm doing that because I want to make sure I get positive quantities and also I want to quadratically penalize my residuals. 
But what if I don't want to be so extreme? I don't want to penalize far residuals to a greater extent to the smaller residuals. Let's say I want to penalize the residuals pretty much the same. I can simply just take the absolute value of the residuals. So I'll still get a positive quantity, but I'm not penalizing extreme deviations as much. And why would you ever penalize to the four if you really want to penalize far, far data points. So, so what that will do is, is it will actually bias the regression line towards points that have currently got high residuals. So why is that not common case? It's just a harder problem to solve analytically. So what the next slide is going to talk about, why do we use least squares and not these other options? Mainly it comes down to the fact that the least squares is easy to calculate. All these others are quite a bit harder to do and certainly not as quick. So I could also penalize the least absolute deviations. Well, here the fifth option is really the most interesting option. And uh, actually now with modern computing systems is not that hard to do. And it should be almost your default option where possible. And it's available in R. It's not available in most other packages because it requires a good optimization library to implement. But this one here penalizes the median of the squared residuals. So you take your you take the least median of squared residuals. So you take your residuals, square them, and you find the median of that. So now I've got a whole lot of positive quantities, the individual residuals squared, and you find the median of those, and then minimize for that. Okay, so that's called the least median of squares models, and there's several implementations of that in R available to you. That's a robust model. And the reason why it's robust is for the following. If we took the data set where I had my points over here, so a least squares model would look as follows. So this is my least squares model. But if I had a data point, in my model over here, let's say I had that green point in my data set as well. Normally, with a small data set, say if you were doing a lab report, you would delete that green point and say this is an outlier, it's unusual. It doesn't follow the tendency of the rest of the data. But if you didn't delete it and you fit your least squares model, you would get that sort of slope of intersect. So this is this is the least squares with outline. Now, what the LMS model will do, the least median of squares model, is you will get pretty much that. This is the least median of squares with the outline. So the least median of squares model because it's using the median as the optimization criteria, is not going to be sensitive to the outlier. Those are great alternative to use if you're building these squares models in an automated way, which is happening far more frequently. The large data sets we're dealing with, we don't have time to pre-screen our data sets to eliminate outliers. So if you can use a tool that will build a least squares model that is insensitive to outliers, you're a big, big step ahead. So, and like I said, this objective function is, is a lot, is a computationally harder. It's not an option in many software packages, but it definitely is available in R. I know it's not available in Excel, and it's not available in um, some of the other tools like MATLAB unless you buy the statistics toolbox. So, great, great option to use. But the least squares model is still one that we come back to all the time, primarily because it's very computationally practical. It's a very quick step to do on any computer. It's a great way to prove various mathematical properties of the least squares model. So we rely on that quadratic nature of the, of the objective function. It's easy to prove certain uh, outcomes. Also, we'll show that under certain conditions, the beta zero, uh, the B zero and B one we estimate have the lowest possible variance possible if we use the least squares model, and that's an important point when we come to confidence intervals later. 
Okay, so I just uh, we've got five minutes or so left. Just quickly talk about how we calculate this. So if you put this in R or Excel or MATLAB, behind the scenes, what what it's doing is it's setting up an optimization form. So how many of you are taking the optimization course at the moment? Yeah, most of you. So you're comfortable with this terminology up here. All the objective function is is saying minimize the sum of squares of the residuals. So minimize a function that's a function of b0 and b1. I'm going to change b0 and b1 until this becomes a minimum. So substituting what e1 is, the residual is y minus b0 minus b1x. Take the sum of squares of that. And what happens is you essentially end up with an objective function if you had to plot it visually that would look like this. So always a bowl shape. Always, always a quadratic bowl that's upside down. And it's always got a unique minimum. You'll always find a single point that solves that objective function right there at the bottom. And the reason for that is because it's a convex bowl. So have you covered convexity yet in 4G? So the least squares problem is a convex problem. It's a sum of squares. <coughs> sum of squares as a convex function always guaranteed a single unique minimum. Okay, so it's got a very, very great advantage to it. If we looked at it uh, from just a single variable perspective, so if I come back to my gas cylinder example, where we know we've got no intercept. So let's just take a look at that. We're trying to predict pressure from temperature. P is PV equals NRT. We, can, we know what V1 is. There is no intercept. So beta zero is zero from theoretical ideal gas law. So I've essentially now got a model where I'm solving P is equal to beta one T. And I can find beta one purely by trial and error. But let's implement what we just learned. Let's try to solve this as a, as a, as a minimizing the sum of squares of residuals. I can write that out as a sum of squares and residuals as follows. So what I'm essentially aiming for is y is beta 1x, or in this notation here, p is equal to beta 1t, so pressure as a, as a function of temperature. If we go back to this objective function, it says find the minimum by changing b1 so that I get the sum of my data from i equals 1 to n of the residuals. Well, what's the residual in this case? E is equal to P minus B1T. So what I, P is minus B1T. So what I can go do is write in here PI minus B1TI square that. So I just go back to that original table of data that I had. I've got multiple pressure values, multiple temperature values. I can substitute that in here. All I'm going to do to solve for that is to vary V1 and find the V1 value in this equation. So V1 is a constant that holds for the whole equation. Find that V1 value so that that term is minimum. And if you set that up in Excel, uh, you can quickly show for yourself you get an objective function that looks as follows. If I change B1 from some low value to some high value, you're going to get a quadratic. So quadratic, it's a convex function, unique minimum. I find the minimum point and that's going to be my estimate B1. It's going to be my best estimate for A1 at the minimum point. So that's in one dimension. In two dimensions, that quadratic just becomes a ball shape function. Because now we're estimating B0 and B1. When we get back uh, from the after the midterm break, we're going to then estimate plus B2, X2, plus B3, X2. We're going to add multiple terms into that.